the Scottish collaboration is taking place from Monday the 5th to Sunday the 11th of December. So why not join us and you might just find your next big obsession. Full details can be found at scottishmergers.com slash collab. Hi everyone. Before we dive into this week's episode, please check out our promo of the week. My name is Mike Morford. Some of you may know me as co-host of the podcast Criminology. I'd like to tell you about a solo podcast that I host, which is very close to my heart. It's called The Murder of My Family. We've all heard about horrible murder cases in the news, both solved and unsolved. Most of the time, we listen for a moment and then go about our daily routine. But have you ever wondered who those murder victims were or thought about their backgrounds? They're more than a blurb in the news or a statistic. They were real people living real lives. They were someone's child, parent, sibling, or friend. In The Murder of My Family, I try to get to know those victims with the help of the people that knew them best, their family members. Together, we talk about the lives and tragic deaths of their loved ones, as well as the ripple effect the murderers had on surviving friends and family. Some of the episodes feature high-profile cases you're probably familiar with, like the Colonial Parkway murders, the Delphi murders, or the Golden State Killer murders. But many other cases are ones from small towns all over America that barely made the news. There are dozens of episodes of The Murder of My Family available right now to binge on. Subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome to our podcast. So, today, Jill, we have a listener requested tale. Ooh. Listener requested tale, it's not a tale. Case, yes. And guess where we are? Oh, God, where are we? Back in France. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they must have loved your last French um, pronunciations. <laughs> I know, I'm like, as much as I love you listeners, what is it about you giving me cases that I can't? When I, can't I actually quite names. like it. So Sarah, who Sarah, yeah. that was uh, asked for this to um, be done, when when I saw that it was from France, because you did tell me, I was like, well, this is going to be interesting. Yeah, so thanks for that, Sarah. Thanks for setting me up for Laura to laugh at me. But I'm going to try really hard. But so right from the off, I am going to apologise because what? Well, <laughs> you can apologise and then I'll tell you what I was saying. <laughs> well, why did you put your hands up? <laughs> I don't know if I was in school there. I know, she just put her hand up. Um, yeah, so I'm going to apologise because, uh, you know, with names, like, I just can't pronounce them. I'm not French. <laughs> I can't speak French. I can't even speak in a French you can't accent. Speak bloody English, never mind French. Yeah, it's very true. So I apologise now. I'm going to be shit at trying to pronounce the names. Okay. Well, before you're going to be shit, <laughs> I have an update on a case that I did a while back. All right, okay. Um, it was a case I did last year, which was about the Stoneman Douglas High School shooting. Yeah. The call. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's just a, at the time when I did the case, there um, obviously they charged uh, the man responsible for it, but he hadn't been um, sentenced or anything like that, yeah. basically. So there's been an update since. So I'm just going to read from uh, the news report that I found. Right, okay. And basically it says that the jury in the sentencing trial of Nicholas Cruz, who killed 17 people in the mass shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, has recommended he receive life in prison and not the death penalty. Nearly a year after Cruz pleaded guilty to all 17 counts of murder and attempted murder, the jury in the penalty phase of his trial handed down a sentence of life in prison for all counts. Cruz faced the death penalty or life in prison for the Valentine's Day 2018 school shooting. Then reviewing each count, the jury agreed that Cruz was guilty of the shooting. However... At least one member of the jury believed that mitigating factors in this case, which was Cruz's mental illness, outweighed the evidence to justify the death penalty. I'm just remembering those in 2016. The guideline for a jury to recommend the death penalty in Florida was changed from a majority vote to a unanimous vote. Right, okay. So because one didn't agree, Mm -hmm. that's basically why he's not been recommended to get Mm -hmm. the death penalty. So the actual sentencing has been postponed until November the 1st in order for victims' families to provide additional testimony to the judge before a sentence is handed down. Um, so by the time this goes out, that'll be 
Uh, yes. Yeah. So I yeah. so maybe by the time it goes out, we might actually have a verdict. So I might have yeah. to update you again. Yeah, we, yeah, we'll update again as we know. But um, you know, as as our listeners know, we always record in advance. So mm-hmm. we're actually still in October at yeah. the moment. I'm yeah. not actually sure what date this will go out. I don't know if it's. Yeah. But I will, I will update you. But it looks like he's going to get a life sentence anyway. This could actually go out on the first of November. I'm not sure. I'm not. I don't know. Yeah. But it, it looks like he's going to get a life sentence. Right. So well. And, and avoid the death penalty. I know everybody's everybody's um, opinions are different, but I think life in prison is better than getting the death penalty because I just that's just my opinion. I know everybody's different, but I don't really see that as a punishment. No. Of getting I, death, I, I, I yeah. think I'd rather they live the rest of their life. In prison. In prison, yeah, 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 being punished. Yeah, basically not getting to live his life at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. Life but yeah, so anyway, back to your case today. So where again are we, Joe? Fucking France. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I love France. I'm just... <laughs> she's just she's different pronouncing names. Yeah, I don't want to offend anybody, honestly. I've been to France a few times and I do like it there. Yes. But I just can't, I'm sorry, I can't pronounce your words. No. But you're going to try. <laughs> and, and, and if not, we'll, we'll laugh at you trying, will we? Mm. Okay. So, so actually, what, I don't even know if we know the title yet. What's the title? Murderous Maids. Ooh, murderous Maids. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> right, well, let's dive in. Okay, so today I'm going to tell you about the Papin sisters. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it. It could be Papin, Papin. We're, we're going with Papin. Okay. Right. So their mother was Clemence. Don't know if that's how you pronounce <laughs> it. We're not going to say that for every word that sounds French. No, but the next one I can pronounce it. Oh, the dad was Gustave. Gustave? Are you sure? That's <laughs> yeah. how you say it? Right, anyway, serious. Right, yeah. Yeah, because this, I, I warn you now, this is a this is a gruesome right. case. Okay. Okay. Yes, serious, yes. So, oh, Clemence and uh, Gustave, they were the parents. So, they met, they got together, but there was rumours that she was having an affair with her boss. Mm-hmm. But Gustave loved her and, went, and got her pregnant. So in 1901, they got married on the 3rd of October and they lived in Le Mans. Mm-hmm. So Gustave's parents totally didn't approve of the marriage mm-hmm. and they called Clemence a scheming woman oh. since she had been the talk of the town for having an affair. All oh, right, okay. So baby Amelia was born on the 12th of February, 1902, but Clemence wasn't really interested. Well, I'll say wasn't really interested. She just wasn't interested in being a mother. Oh, right, okay. And she was still having an affair with her boss. Oh, right. Um, so Gustav, he had his suspicions and he would like try and catch them out, like he would try and catch them together, but he never quite managed it, so he didn't actually get to prove it. Right. Um, so he decided he was taking a job in, a, in another city, so Clemens and the baby had to move there with him. Mm-hmm. Um, his thinking was that she would change if she was away from her lover. Mm-hmm. Um, so she was raging because, you know, she's having it off with somebody else and being made to move <laughs> yeah. and Gustav he started to drink he was like sort of developed a drinking problem mm-hmm. and she actually threatened suicide rather than having to leave oh right but then she realized she had to go with him because she was pregnant again <laughs> see so baby Christine was born on the 8th of March in 1905 um so the marriage it just kept going downhill uh, Clemence just moaned all the time that she was tired of taking care of two children. <laughs> um, so Gustave decided to send Christine, the daughter, um, to live with his sister Isabel, who lived nearby. Just the one? Uh-huh. So, yeah, so far. Okay. <laughs> um, Isabel was single, as she said that men were the incarnation of evil, mm-hmm. but she wanted to be a mum. So oh, she right. was quite happy to have Christine, and they lived happily together for seven years, because right, uh, yeah. Christine lived with her. Uh-huh. So, just rewind a bit. On the 19th of September, 1911, Clemence gave birth again mm-hmm. to their third daughter, Leah. Right. So, Amelia was now 10, so that's the oldest one. Mm-hmm. Um, and she'd actually told her mum that Gustav had raped her, her dad. Oh, wow. Um, so, you would think that, you know, Clemence would step up and look, look after her daughter, you know, be there for her because she's been, you know, abused or whatever. Mm-hmm. No. She believed that Amelia had seduced her dad, was oh, ten year old, had uh-huh. seduced her dad, uh-huh. um, and she sent her to an orphanage. Oh. So, but Clemence did leave the star as well. Mm-hmm. So it, she blamed both of them. Right. Okay. Um. So and she asked asked for a divorce. Mm-hmm. So she gave Leah to her uncle, and she put Christine into the same orphanage as Amelia. So she took Christine away from Isabel, her auntie, she was quite happy where there. she was quite happy living with them. I don't know 
engines and outs of it. I don't know why. Yeah. I think just to be a bitch, to mm-hmm. be completely honest. Um, this orphanage was a really religious one, and they were known to be cruel. I, well, I say cruel to the children, but as in like, dis- like quite strong with the discipline and mm. stuff like that. Yeah. Um, probably, probably was more acceptable then, maybe not so acceptable mm. now. <laughs> but she knew that, and but she was still quite happy for her children to go really? and live there. Okay. Um, yeah, she doesn't bother her ass. So Leah, the youngest one, she lived with her uncle until he died. Um, and then Clement sent her to a different orphanage to the other to her sisters. And I'm like, well, why did you not just send them? What a shame. To the same one. sisters didn't even get much of a bond together. Oh, oh, well, 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 obviously, yeah, okay. <laughs> in, in the childhood. Yeah, so Christine and Amelia, they grew up close to each other, being in the same place, you know, being in the same orphanage. And Amelia, you know, looked out for Christine and, you know, was the big, yeah. big sister to her. Uh-huh. Um, but when Amelia was old enough, she actually stayed there and she became a nun. All right. So I kind of thought, well, maybe it could have been that bad then. You know, she oh, yeah. decided to stay on and uh-huh. she wanted to be there yeah. as an adult. So Christine, she had planned on following in her fist, fist, and her sister. <laughs> that, that's not even a French word. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, Christine planned on following in her sister's footsteps, but Clemence had other ideas. Oh. He was absolutely horrified that Amelia had become a nun as she had plans to take them out as soon as they were old enough to be put to work. Um, but Amelia was obviously old enough to take her vows, but she mustn't have been old enough to work. Right, okay. Um, so Clements couldn't do anything about it because she'd already took her vows oh, to be a nun. So. Right, okay. But she could about she, um, the other two. So uh-huh. Christine and Leah were still young enough for her to have her say over what they did. Although I, I just don't understand why. Like, if she gave them up and put them in an orphanage... Like, how has she got any... Yeah, exactly. Them, yeah. Why has she got any say over what happens to them? Because uh-huh. I, I thought putting them in an orphanage kind of gives up your rights, does it not? I don't... You would think so, but... Maybe not. Maybe there was nothing in writing or anything like that. Maybe. maybe. I don't Again, know. Again, different times, different ways. Of it. Yeah, I have no idea. No. Um, so, Clemence waited for Christine to finish her studies, and when she was 15, she took her out of the orphanage because she wanted Christine to work and hand over her wages to her. I mean, like, Clemence, she sort of dreamed of having a life of luxury, basically. Mm-hmm. So she didn't want her kids, but it was good enough for when they were old enough. To make money for her. They could make the money while she just sat in her arse and fucked her boss or whatever, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, so she worked, um, Christine worked as a maid for a few different families, but Clemence was never happy with the amount of money she was being paid, so she would make her leave, like, each employment when, when she found... Another employment that was paying better wages. Right, okay. Like, right, you've got to leave there. Yeah, go and work there. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, in April 1926, she started working for the Lancelin family, which consisted of the dad, Rene, mum, Leonie, and daughter, Genevieve. I don't know how old Genevieve was, but I did read that she was going to be getting married soon, so she was obviously a, I think she was maybe like late teens or something, you know, mm. an older, an yeah. older child. Yeah. Um, they had another daughter, but she was she'd already got married and moved out. Mm-hmm. So she started working there, and after a while, um, Christine convinced Lainey to hire Leah, Leah as a chambermaid. All right. Um. So as they were working together, the sisters became really close because obviously they weren't before because they grew up in different orphanages. Mm-hmm. Um, and Christine would look after Leah just as Amelia had looked after her. Mm-hmm. And at first, like all was good. Uh, Lainey was. She was really demanding about the way that she liked the house kept, but she was actually the, the one to actually stop Clemence from taking Christine and Leah's wages. Oh, right. Because they must have told her, and uh-huh. she was like, nah, no, that's no. not happening. Yeah. You know, You're the one doing the work. You're yeah, the money. Yeah, exactly. So she, she put a stop oh, wow. to that. That's good. And um, Ren- Renee, he got them insurance, so they were covered in case an accident happened, which was, like, really unusual for that in that time. Like, and, right, uh-huh. You know, back then in that place, that wasn't really a thing that happened. Like you didn't get insurance for your, for your mates. Yeah. Uh-huh. But I did. So it sounds like a good place to work. It must be a really nice holiday, sounds it? Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, yeah. Um, at, at some point, Le- Leonie she developed depression and became quite critical of the sisters' cleaning. Mm. She would like do a white glove test. Oh. If, the, if the dusting had been done properly. Do you know I had a boss when I worked at Blockbuster. Did you? That did, did that? Yeah, he came in with his white glove and I remember him going across the top and to be honest it was full of dust. <laughs> but I just thought, you fucking prick. I was like, oh, fuck off. 
honestly, absolutely. I was like, I just, I honestly, can't that's, believe I did it. That, I mean, is that not what cleaners are for? Though? Did you not have cleaners to do that? Like, that wasn't your job. Uh, yeah, Blockbuster it was. We didn't have cleaners. Oh, did you not have cleaners? No. Right? Not, not like now. <laughs> I have cleaners that do it at work now, but no, we didn't have cleaners. Oh. But we had to do the... So that was part of your job and you actually, you actually, sh- you were shit at it then? Well, I just didn't fucking do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you cleaned all the counters and stuff, but it was like, with all the, the, you know, the dummy boxes of like all the games and DVDs, mm-hmm. it was like wired sort of shelving. And I had a spit on the top and I was like, I'm not doing that. Too much effort. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, so she used to do that. Um, and there were some occasions when we were laying <coughs> Sorry, I just had a bit of Sorry. <laughs> um, but, uh, there, were, there were some occasions where Leonie physically assaulted them if she wasn't satisfied. And there was one time Leah was pinched so hard that she actually fell to her knees in pain. Oh, right. So they weren't so nice after all. <laughs> yeah, but I don't think it um, warrants what happened no, in the end. Probably not. So the girls would wake up at 7 o'clock each morning. Their morning jobs would involve going to the market. Then they would have to make lunch, and then they would also start preparing the evening meal. Depending on if the household was having any visitor that day, they might they might you know have other duties to do. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they were allowed a couple of hours off after lunch, whereas most maids would maybe go for for a walk or go, you know. But Lenny, eh, sorry, Chris, Christine and Leah, they would just go to their room and just spend the time together in their rooms. Mm, right. Um. And I'm assuming after that, they must have done the cleaning mm-hmm. after that. Yeah. So, and then also, they had Sundays off. So on Sundays, they would dress up and they would go to church. And then they'd go home and just spend the rest of the day in their room. They were quiet, kept themselves to themselves. Christine was described as sometimes being insolent. But apart from that, they had reputations as being diligent workers with proper behaviour. Mm-hmm. So by 1933, they'd been working for the Lancelins for six years. So Christine was 27 and Leah was 21. So the iron had broken and had been sent out to, to be repaired. Mm-hmm. So on the 2nd of February 1933, the sisters went to pick it up. Which is laughing because in this day and age, if it breaks, we just go and buy just a new one. buy a new one. Yeah. I mean, literally, my iron broke. Well, it didn't break. It just, it was just a few weeks ago and I was ironing. And I was like, there's no steam coming from this. It just didn't seem to iron properly. Within like five minutes, John had went on to Amazon and he was like, mm, "Will that one do?" Ah, that's fine. And, and it was here the next game day. Yes, I know. Well, I had to get an iron board because my iron board leg had rusted off, <laughs> so I had to go and buy a new one of them. But uh, yeah, you you just well we don't the same thing is like to get repaired do we? No, we that's don't. probably really bad. It is. I, I think that's the 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 world we live in today. Though, yeah, isn't it? but I think it's so cheap to get an iron. Like I mean, the iron that we had in the first place was probably only what twenty quid. So what's why well, not to be honest? There's, there's not really many places. Where would you go and get an iron fixed? At the iron fixer place. <laughs> that doesn't exist. Um, an electrical place. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Honestly, I actually don't know where I would get an iron fixer. Exactly. Anyway. Um. Yeah. yeah. So they went to pick it up. They picked up the picked up the iron. Mm-hmm. So they were in the house. They came back. They were in the house alone, and Christine started to to do the ironing, but the iron was still faulty. Mm-hmm. So that guy's rubbish. I uh, asking for money back. Mm-hmm. Um, and it blew a fuse, and the whole house, it like tripped the whole house, and it ended up in darkness. Mm-hmm. So at 5.30 p.m., Le- Leonie and her daughter Genevieve came back um, to the house. They'd been out, I think they'd been out sh- like shopping or something. So they, and, um, they, pop- they must have been like popping the shopping bags in the house before going out again, because they were going out with Renee, the dad, right, yeah. um, for dinner at a family friend's house. But they never turned up for dinner. So Renee was obviously meeting Renee was obviously meeting them there. Uh-huh. So Renee waited till about six thirty, and it, by then he was getting worried. So he and his son-in-law decided to go to the house to see what was happening. Mm-hmm. So they, when they got there, they couldn't get in as the door was bolted from the inside. Right. So the house was dark except for a faint light coming from a bedroom upstairs, which was probably a candle because mm-hmm. there was no electricity. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so they knew that somebody was in the house because obviously the door was bolted from the yeah, outside exactly. and there was a candle on. Um, so they were like, mm, you know, something's not right here. Like, mm-hmm. let, we'll go to the police. So they went to the nearby, 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 nearby police station. Mm-hmm. So the police thought that a prowler might well have broken into the house and like maybe, I don't know, like tied everybody up and <laughs> stolen all their belongings. So the sergeant and the two officers went to the house with Renee and his son-in-law. So the police wanted to catch the thief red-handed, so didn't want to like alert them to their presence, so they like sneaked, mm-hmm. sneaked around the back, and they were really quiet and climbed over a 
courtyard wall mm -hmm. and then at the back of the house there was a glass door which was locked but the officers you know obviously just get a few elbows or no shoulders it's you shoulder the door don't uh -huh, you yeah um and they went out of the house so they went out of the house it was totally silent so they looked around like the ground floor mm -hmm. nah, nothing nobody, no, nothing to be nothing to be seen here mm -hmm. so they was like okay we'll go upstairs so they had their torches and their guns and they like started walking up the stairs so suddenly the first officer stopped on the stairs as he saw a round object on the top step he looked closer and he thought it was a marble mm -hmm. oh i actually know what you're gonna say it's gonna be an eye isn't it an eyeball yeah <laughs> but on even closer inspection he realized it was an eye Blah. i thought it was a bit gruesome mm. So they climbed the last couple of steps, and on the landing, they found the bodies of Leonie and Genevieve. So their faces were unrecognisable, their eyes had been gouged out, and they had been beaten and stabbed. Oh God, that sounds awful. Mm -hmm. So their skirts were pulled above their head, like over their heads. Their genitals were mutilated. Leonie was lying on her back with her legs apart, and Genevieve was lying face down. And there was a bloody kitchen knife next to her hip. Right. So Leonie's uh, skull was completely bashed in on the right side mm -hmm. and her eyeballs were tucked in her she had a scarf on mm -hmm. and the, her eyeballs were in the like in the oh, folds of her scarf God. so obviously the eyeball on the stair uh -huh. was, was genevieve's uh -huh. um and her other one was found under her body why have you got your finger on your eye because i got an itch oh, <laughs> oh i just think i was like doing that because i don't know what you did <laughs> um yeah so they found her eyeball under her body oh. uh, and they were like teeth oh, battered oh god you right. stop doing that well it's horrible i know it's horrible but i'm trying to tell the case compose yourself <laughs> she's in the hot room now <laughs> in the <hut>. i love you <laughs> shut up you can tell me your what? pronunciations come on i don't want to laugh at you again shut up right so yeah there was t there was teeth shattered shattered scattered <laughs> See, it last long. Oh my god, this is such a horrible, gruesome case, and we are laughing. And we're not laughing at that. I know, but I feel guilty. Right, shut up, Ben Gilbert. <laughs> Hell, woman. <laughs> so, there were teeth. <laughs> Stop it. There were teeth scattered around, and there was blood all over the floor, and even splattered onto the walls two meters above the body. I mean, can you imagine just the That's thought of awful. that scene? Mm -hmm. That's awful. I know. So the officers then headed towards Christine and Leah's room as they fully expected to find them somewhere along the way, beaten and killed, the same way as Leonie and Genevieve. So they thought they were still going along with, there's been a prowler that yeah. came in. And... So they got to the sister's room and the door was locked. So it was locked for, like with a key. Mm -hmm. So it could have been locked from either inside or outside. Mm -hmm. So they knocked, but nobody answered. So they summoned a locksmith to open the door. Still fully expecting the sisters to be dead, like because they hadn't answered when they knocked, they thought they were going to open this door. Yeah, find them the dead sisters were going to be dead. Mm -hmm. But when they got into the room, there was Christine and Leah snuggling in bed together naked. Sorry, so, snuggling in bed together <laughs> naked. Yeah, and their sisters. Yeah. If you ever try to get in bed with me naked, you can bugger off. Oh my god, I haven't even tried. Thank you very much. <laughs> No, thank you. So, yeah, yeah. So they were they were in bed. There was a bloody hammer with hair stuck to it, like stuck to all the blood and that, and um, sitting on a chair next to the bed. Christine looked at them and said, "We've been expecting you." So, lovely. The sergeant asked what had happened, and Christine said, "Quote: They wanted to hit me, so I got my own back. It was either us or them, and I would rather do my masters in than let them do us in." End quote. Right, but. I mean, you could have just given a little punch or something. I mean, it's a bit extreme. <laughs> could have just given a little punch. Could have ducked. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. But I mean, like, it just seems a bit extreme. Like, if, well, somebody, yeah, wanted, I mean, if somebody wanted to hit me, I wouldn't go, oh, well, that's it. I'm going to completely murder them and bash their skulls and gouge their eyes out and whatever. I mean, mm. that's just really extreme for what they like to Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Very extreme. So they were told to get up and get dressed. Christine was asked if she murdered Leonie and Genevieve by herself, but Leah shouted out that it was her that had murdered them. Then Christine said that she had murdered the mother. So they were both kind of like trying to take the heat off each other. Like, I don't know. think they were going to take any heat off each other. Christ, they were both as bad as each other, but it sounds like... 
So as the sisters were getting dressed, the sergeant decided to ask Leah some questions, as she seemed to be the most fragile. Mm-hmm. Christine just acted like she didn't give a fuck. Right. Um, but Leah must be maybe a bit, a bit nervous or scared or whatever. So when he asked Leah a question, she like looked at Christine, and Christine just gave her a look to, as if to say, like, don't say anything. Mm. So Leah just turned around and said to the sergeant, I'm deaf and I'm dumb. Oh. Right. So that was, was what they were getting the honey of her. Right, okay. <laughs> so the sisters were arrested and taken into custody and were asked what happened that night. So here's their version because obviously we don't have anybody else's. Mm, yeah. So Christine said that her mistresses arrived at about 5.30pm. It was dark and Leah had closed the shutters. She told them about the iron still being broken, mm-hmm. so she couldn't do the ironing. Mm-hmm. And Christine said that Leon- Leonie was angry and was about to set upon Christine. So all four women were on the landing at the top of the stairs, where basically where the bodies were found. Mm-hmm. And Christine said that before, so, so obviously she's like, Leonie was going to attack me. So before Leonie could attack her, she lunged at her and gouged her eyes out with her fingers. Like, like how can you do that? It's like, I, yeah, I mean, like, you'd have to press, like, I really know. hard. Oh, yeah. Fuck. Anyway. Yeah, can we move on from that? Um, Leah followed suit. And lunged at Gen- Genevieve. Genevieve. Is that her name? Mm-hmm. Yes. I think I've typed it funny. I think that's why. <laughs> um, and gouged her eyes out. Right. So as the two mistress- mistresses were lying on the floor, Christine ran to the kitchen and got a hammer and a knife. So she gave one of them to Leah, and she had the other one, and they started hitting and slashing. Um, Christine said that they hit them over the head with the hammer and also with a pewter pot that had been sitting on a wee table on the landing. Mm-hmm. Throughout the attack, the sisters kept swapping weapons um, and just kept going until both the women were dead. That's awful. And as I said before, the gen- genitals were mutilated mm-hmm. and Genevieve's menstrual blood was smeared over them. Oh. Yeah, like, I have no idea what that, why or what did that not, means. Did or... they not explain why they did that? No. Oh. Yeah, so obviously she had her period. And... Oh. That's awful. Yeah. It is gruesome, isn't mm-hmm. it? So when they were finished, Christine locked the front door, they went to the kitchen and washed their hands, and then they went upstairs to their room, laid the hammer on the chair, and got into bed. Right. So Christine told the police that she had no regrets, she didn't plan the crime, and she didn't hate her mistresses, but she didn't accept the gesture that Lance, Mrs. Lancelin had towards her that night. Okay. Now, for her saying that she didn't hate her mistresses, that's, to me that sounded like like hate, yeah, like, yeah, no, that's to right. brutally do that to somebody. Exactly, and then like to even like stop, go downstairs, get weapons, uh-huh. carry on, swap weapons. That's that's more than that's that's more than spur of the moment, yeah, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. Like spur of the moment, or maybe like I don't know. Yeah, like, she might have like pushed her down the stairs or something. You know, I mean, if she'd, if, you know, Lena was gonna she, punch if, her or yeah. whatever, and she'd reacted and because she's made it sound like it was self defense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, she was gonna go for me, so I went for her first. Yeah. But if she was gonna like punch you, well, duck. <laughs> or, or, you know, punch her before she can yeah, get it. Yeah, sure, yeah. whatever, yeah. There's, like, to actually to do that. And murder and the way that they've done it, though, that's that's not just a, a, a self-defence no. sort of thing, is it? So when Leah was questioned, she basically just told them the same as what Christina told them. But I'm sure they probably had what they were going to say all planned out while they were, like, lying yeah, in bed yeah. together, like, waiting. Because I think they'd said that it was exactly, their stories mm. were exactly the same, yeah. you know, but too much. Aye. So when, while they were in jail, Christine had quite a few explosive moments in her cell. She said she was having hallucinations. She was shouting out for Leah. And at one point, she tried to gouge her own eyes out. So she was putting a straight jacket. So the court appointed three doctors to do psychological evaluation. Evaluation? I was really trying to get past that with it. Evaluation? Evaluations on the sisters to determine whether or not they were sane. Mm-hmm. So Christine indicated that she just didn't give a shit about anybody except Leah. Mm-hmm. And the doctors reported that Christine's affection for her sister, it, you know, it was just, um, family devotion. You know, she loved her sister, you know, she didn't give a shit about anybody else. Mm-hmm. And for Leah, her affection for Christine was because she represented like a mother figure because obviously she didn't have a mother yeah. grown up, did she? No. So the doctors reported that they didn't detect any kind of sexual context within the relationship because some people do think that the reasons that the, the reason that they killed their mistresses was because they had walked in on them being incestuous 
Mm. So they had to kill them to keep their secret. Mm -hmm. So the report also said that neither of them seemed to have acted on the other one's suggestion. So basically they were both as bad as each other mm -hmm. and were responsible for their own actions. So they both shared their responsibility, responsibility equally for the murders. Right. So now, although the doctors reported that they didn't detect any kind of sexual relationship between the sisters, when Christine and Leah were allowed to see each other, Christine spoke in a way that did imply a sexual relationship. Right. But Leah acted as if Christine was a mother figure still, you know, so right, okay. maybe Christine had some feelings that... Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> um, so the report stated that the sisters had no pathological mental disorders and no family history as such. The doctors deemed them completely sane. Mm -hmm. So the trial started on the 29th of September, 1933. 200 police officers were in attendance to control the crowd, wow. as there were that many people there. Mm -hmm. And when the sisters were brought in, everyone turned to look at them, and the public were actually disappointed, as they expected two Jezebels. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they, they went, they, they, they. <laughs> I know we always say we shouldn't comment on anybody's looks, but they were just ordinary looking yeah, you know yeah. was, they weren't like nothing special think, about them all right yeah i think people were expecting that to be all like sort of like beautiful and makeup and yeah hair. but uh, yeah all makeup and maybe a bit provocatively yeah. provocatively provocatively dressed and stuff like yeah, that yeah uh -huh. but they were christine looked down the whole time and looked like she didn't give a shit <laughs> and uh leah, leah looked frightened throughout the trial they both answered questions timidly and quietly Sometimes they could barely be heard. They admitted to everything, but they didn't give an explanation for what they did. Right. So, however, their lawyers argued that Christine and Leah were not of sound mind when the act had been committed. Mm -hmm. And it, he also told the court that there was mental illness in the family, because remember, those doctors had said that there wasn't any family yeah. history. But they had an uncle who committed suicide. I'm not sure if it's the uncle that was looking after, looking after um, Leah, because mm -hmm. They said the uncle died, but I don't know if it was him or if it was a different one. Mm -hmm. Um, but he'd he'd commit suicide. A a cousin who had died in an insane asylum, and a grandfather who was knowing who was known for having fits of violent rage, as evidence of a pre predisposition towards insanity. Right. So there was mental yeah. illness in the mm -hmm. family. So when the jury retired to deliberate, it took them just forty minutes to decide the sisters' fate. They were both found guilty. Mm -hmm. So Christine was sentenced to death by guillotine, so she would be beheaded. Mm -hmm. And Leah was sentenced to 10 years of hard labour and 20 years of exile. Oh, right. So Christine's sentence was actually later reduced to life in prison. Mm -hmm. um, but she, like, she couldn't bear being separated from Leah. And she displayed bouts of madness and she became severely depressed and she actually stopped eating. All right. That's a little funny the way I said eating there. Mm. Eating. Mm -hmm. um, so she was transferred to a mental hospital, but she still refused to eat and she died in May 1937. Oh, wow. So that was only, like, what, four years mm -hmm. that she was in prison for and died. Yeah, bloody hell. So Leah was totally different. She just got on with serving her sentence. Mm -hmm. She was like, right, okay, yeah, keep going. Yeah. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. um, but she was let out early for good behaviour, so she served eight years in prison. Right, okay. Um, in 1941, she was a free woman, and she lived with her mother, Clemence. I mean, like, who goes back to live with that mother? No, well, I know. In fact, she never lived with her mother in the first place. Oh, no, she didn't, did she? So, no. Uh, oh, well. Um, so she went to live with her mum, and, and she, she uh, changed her name, and she worked as a maid in a hotel. Oh, my God. I'm surprised she got a job <laughs> as a bloody maid, but I suppose if she changed her name, then... Yeah, so... Um, so, so some accounts state that Le Leah died in 1982. Mm-hmm. But a French film producer, Claude Ventura, claims that he found Leah living in a hospice centre in France in the year 2000, right. while he was creating a film called In Search for the Papine Sisters. So this Leah that he found was shown on the film. Mm -hmm. she, was par um, she was partially paralysed as the result of a stroke, mm -hmm. and she couldn't speak. Right. And she died in 2001 at the age of 89, but it's not known if the film producer could actually prove that this was the real Oh, Leah. Right, okay. uh -huh. so, so I mean it could have been, it might not have been. Yeah, we don't know. But when I looked on um I looked on I don't know if you've heard about it, but it's a thing called uh, findagrave.com. Oh, right, no. Um so basically you can look up people that have died, mm -hmm. obviously. Yeah. Um and she's listed Leah Leah's listed as dying in um two thousand and one. So, right, so it no could one. have been her. Yeah, it could have been. Yeah. So so there are some theories about the sisters. So as I said before, there could be the 
having an incestuous relationship mm-hmm. when they were walked in on, so they felt they had to kill it, keep their secret. Yeah. So, yeah. That's maybe. Maybe. Well, yeah, they were found naked in the bed, so... Yeah, like... well, that's kind of, that, That's the thing that only... But then they might have just been naked because they had blood all over their clothes and... Mm. But they'd take a change and stuff, wouldn't they? Mm. Yeah. Um. So some people sympathise with the girls and could empathise with their class struggle. It was all about class. Oh, right, okay. Um. They saw the crime as a reflection of oppressive class divisions, poor working conditions, and prejudice. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, there are people who believe that the girls worked in a decent employment. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, they did say that maybe Leonie did physically assault them. Mm-hmm. Did she? We, we don't know. Oh, well, we don't know, yeah. yeah. We don't know. Um, but, I mean, they ate the same meals mm-hmm. as their employers. Right. Um, they got a good salary. So mm-hmm. there was no logical yeah. motive for murder. No. Um. So others say that the girls were starved of love and affection, so it was something deeply rooted from their childhood. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, it's a hard one because, like, they did spend most of their years away from their parents' instability mm-hmm. and lived with family mem- members who did love them because yeah. one was with an auntie, the other one was with an uncle. That's true. Yeah, they went to an orphanage. Mm-hmm. but There was years of love there. Yeah, there was. And as I said before with the orphanage, I mean, like, Christine and Amelia both wanted to be nuns. They wanted to stay there. Mm-hmm. So... It couldn't have been that bad. It, yeah, but it wasn't that bad. Mm-hmm. So it, they might have actually been happy there. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm not... I don't, I don't no. know. So at the trial, a fourth doctor had actually testified, and he said that the girls could certainly not be normal. He suggested that the relationship between Leah and Christine was a complete merger of personalities, and that Leah had lost her identity to the dominant personality of Christine. Mm -hmm. So basically he was saying that there was no Christine and there was no Leah. The killer was really the joint a joint personality of the two, like a third identity. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's quite a good take, though. Yeah. One psychotherapist called Elizabeth Kerry Mahon Mahon, said, quote, the two sisters seem to suffer from what is called shared paranoid disorder. This condition tends to occur in small groups or pairs who become isolated from the world. They often lead an intense, inward-looking existence with a paranoid view of the outside world. It is also typical in shared paranoid disorder that one partner one partner dominates the other, and the Papin sisters seem to be a perfect example of this. End quote. Others think that they suffer from folio do, which, if anyone remembers, we covered a case back in series three mm-hmm. about twins. Mm-hmm. Who suffered from that so if you have if you haven't listened to it it's called a moment of madness and it's series three episode one mm-hmm. um so as you might it was they had a moment of madness, madness. yeah and that's what that they're saying that could have been yeah so according to wikipedia, wikipedia folly or do sounds pretty much the same as the shared paranoid disorder but it's like a shared psychosis mm-hmm. or shared delusional disorder so that's mm-hmm. could have been yeah. So this, this syndrome is most commonly diagnosed when two people live in cl- close proximity. They may be socially or physically isolated and have little interaction with other people. So basically, when one of them has a psychotic episode, the other one does too. Right. So what do you think? I think that that's probably logical, that they had a psychotic episode and... I think so, but because they were deemed sane, mm-hmm. and as you know, going back to the twins episode, <coughs> series three, mm-hmm. so so were they. They were yeah. deemed sane, and just it was a just a moment of madness. madness. Yeah. So I, I think, think it probably was that. Yeah, I think it was too. I don't see any other explanation personally for that. I mean, I know we don't know the ins and outs of. But to oh, do something that violent, yeah, yeah. it sounds to me like a moment of madness. Yeah. So thank yeah. you. Sorry, it was a gruesome one. Yes. And you did no bad. Thanks, to Sarah. Yes, thanks, Sarah. Sure. <laughs> if anybody else has any recommendations um, or anything that they'd like us to cover, yeah, then can, please get in touch with us. Yeah, you can contact us. We can, you can send us like a DM on um, Instagram or Twitter, and we're crime underscore divers underscore pod. Um, or you can send us an email. So that's crime underscore divers underscore pod at outlook.com. Um, we're on YouTube and what's the other one? TikTok, TikTok. Crime Divers Podcast. If you would like to buy us a coffee, as we a couple of people have done recently, mm-hmm. um, it's buymeacoffee.com slash Crime Divers. And if you'd like to join our Patreon for bonus episodes, early access ep- episodes, add free episodes, add free episodes, then that's patreon.com slash Crime Divers. And as always, if you haven't already, please don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review. Thanks for listening. Bye.